People tell me that they can hear my laugh from across the room. As I've gotten older, it's gotten louder. <laughs> and my husband likes to say that if he could get lost inside my head, he would find double rainbows and lollipops and shooting stars. And it's true. I've spent my life cultivating happiness. If I could come back again and again, I would. But five years ago, almost to this day, April 16th, I was a student here, and all of that changed. I remember waking up and feeling foggy like I had the flu. I had Spanish class that morning, and I thought a cup of coffee would make me feel better. I went outside to my patio. It's still kind of wet, and the fog was in the air. And I nursed those first sips. And I, it happened in a moment, and it, and it felt like a moment when I lost the safety and the security of the woman that I had spent 32 long years learning to love. My thoughts brought me to my knees as I could see myself hanging from the tree in the backyard. I knew something was terribly wrong. Never had a suicidal ideation ever before in my life love life, but without my warning or permission, for the first time in my life, my thoughts were dangerously out of my control. An hour later, I discovered I was pregnant. I thought that getting pregnant would be the happiest time of my life. I was going to be like Demi Moore on the cover of Vanity Fair and paint my body, and I was going to take of uh, prenatal yoga classes and wear really cool, stretchy black clothes. And <laughs> <laughs> but for me, with the collision of this egg to this sperm, my body reacted so different. It was like my brain was getting short-circuited. And I just knew that I went to bed one way, and eight hours later, I woke up completely different. Within a couple of days, my thoughts about taking my own life turn into thoughts of harming other people's lives. It would come in a flash, in impulses, and ideas that wouldn't stop. They came every second, every second of the day. It was thoughts like, what if I take my foot off the accelerator when somebody, or the brake when somebody's walking in front of my car? What if I drop a match in the forest? What if I pour bleach in my husband's drink? What if I go to bed tonight and I don't know and I wake up and I kill him and then I'm caught? I could see these horrible things. I could see the police coming. I could see them asking what happened and I would be sitting with body parts all over me thinking, I don't know. I could see my cell. I could see my orange jumpsuit. I could see the newspaper articles. She seemed like such a normal girl. I wanted a straight jacket. I begged to be hospitalized anything to make sure I didn't go through with any of my thoughts. I learned later that this was called, these were called intrusive thoughts. It's a form of OCD and, and it lives on the spectrum of a postpartum mood disorder. The problem with that name is that it makes you think that it's after the baby's born. This was right when I conceived my baby. My OCD turned into a severe depression and I lost my joy for living within a couple of days. I thought I was going to kill myself. I couldn't be left alone. This once happy woman who had been in the Peace Corps twice, an AmeriCorps volunteer once, who drove cross country four different times, twice by myself, couldn't even leave the house by myself, couldn't drive by myself. I dropped out of my classes. My parents had to come and help take care of me with my husband. I couldn't be left alone. I was like a child. The one thing that I did do, which a lot of women don't do, was I didn't suffer in silence. I asked for help. I asked for a lot of help. This, I asked all these people for help. Doctors, OBs, therapists, doctors, psychiatrists, specialists, uh, more therapists. I went to a holy lama for a blessing. I went to a priest. I went to an energy healer, an acupuncturist. It took 29 different people before I got the help that I needed when I was six months pregnant. I know I'm alive today because of all the people that came to my rescue who wouldn't let me be alone. At that first OB appointment at the top, I was seven weeks pregnant because they do it in lunar months, so I was really only pregnant for two weeks. And the woman asked me how I was feeling, and I told her that I didn't feel like myself. I said that 
I feel really sad. And without a pause, she said, you should be happy. You're having a baby. Up till the 80s, it was believed that women were immune from depression or a mood disorder when they were pregnant because of all the feel-good hormones. But what about if they don't mesh well in your own body? It seemed like every doctor I talked to or psychiatrist or therapist didn't have a clue what was happening to me. I was told that I had ADD, which I don't. I was told that I was having a hard time becoming a mother, which sure, I knew I needed to be on for my upcoming, my son that was coming out of me, but I was going crazy. I knew what I wanted to die, that was the plan. I would have my baby and then I would end my life. I knew it was a horrible thing to leave for him, but it was so painful just to breathe and to live. I called um, a therapist that the school had, and you get three free visits, and um, they said that my problem was too big. They couldn't see me. I called a community uh, therapist session clinic here, and, and they said that um, I had too good of insurance. They couldn't see me. I told this one therapist, the first therapist I saw, and she said that I needed to white knuckle it. There was nothing I could do for the duration of the pregnancy. She told me to read some books and to call 911 if I thought I was going to kill myself. I think it was April 19th. I called 911 because I thought I was going to kill myself. I was talking to my best friend today, and she kept calling me that morning. And she would call like every couple of minutes, and I heard it in her voice. She was just calling to check up because she knew that I was not in a good place. And I called 911, and I said that I couldn't breathe and that I was pregnant. I couldn't tell them that I thought I was going to end my own life. I saw the man that saved my life yesterday. His name is Buzz, and he's a firefighter here in Monterey. And I remember him coming in and giving me oxygen, and I felt like everything was going to be okay. It did get okay way later down that line when I found Meg. She's a therapist here at Monterey, and she said that what I had was common. It's the leading complication of pregnancy, which is a mood disorder, which OCD lives on in depression and anxiety and psychosis. She said that she could help me, and she did. It took a long time to find the right medication for me. I did have to get on medication while pregnant, and I ended up calling some specialists at Stanford, and they said they couldn't talk to me. <laughs> and I called a maternal mental health clinic in uh, in the Midwest, and they said they could only talk to my OB. Um, I just got the craziest responses. <laughs> I knew that I was suffering, and I, I couldn't help but think maybe the women that we hear about on television who toss babies off of roofs and who drive into the river with their children in the car or who jump from buildings, if they were just like me and had asked for help 29 times and were ushered out of doctor's offices. So fast forward four and a half years later, my son, and I have another son, and he was 10 months old yesterday. And for the birth of my second son, Dylan, I didn't have anything. I, I knew what I was looking for, and I had safety plans, and we were watching for it, and I was on a low dose of medication to prevent it, and everything turned out great, and it should be the end of the story, and I wish it was. I wish I could leave it alone, but I can't because I was normal one day, and then I w was different, and then I asked for help, and then I asked for help, and I did it again and again and again, and it just took too long, and I, I don't know why I can't shake it, but I can't. So a couple months ago, I found another mom. Her name's Jennifer. She had what I had, intrusive thoughts. Hers was about knives. It came in her third trimester. No doctor ever told her it was possible. She kept it a secret for six months, finally came out when her baby was three months old and got help right away. She's a hero. She started support groups for other moms in her community and is starting support groups for moms in other communities. I mean, this woman's fantastic. And I asked her, I said, do you want to make a documentary with me about this? And just like that first doctor, without a moment of hesitation or pause, she says yes. So that's what we're doing. We wish that we knew what happened to us, 
she's looking for a way to make sure it doesn't happen to other moms. And I really want to know what happened to me. I want to know what the flick in my head was. I want to know if it can happen again. This is the boogeyman in my closet I am so afraid to talk about because I'm afraid I'll conjure it back into my life. So along the way, this is what we found out just to share with you. This is not new. It is 2,400 years old. Hippocrates was the first one to document it. So I'm thinking it's even older than that. He documented the first case. He thought it was fluids backing up from the woman's placenta going to her brain and driving her mad. Good guess. I think it's a pretty good guess. <laughs> I also thought maybe this was a rich, white, American woman disorder. It's not. <laughs> it's all over the world. 34% of mothers in South Africa get this. It's in the Congo. It's in Kenya. It's in Goa, India at 37%. They found out in Norway that this is most prevalent in their community with older women. I read that um, women of color were most likely to get this. Uneducated women were most likely to get this. Young mothers were most likely to get this. People with lack of resources, people that had had depression before were most likely to get this. I can say yes to none of that. So why did my doctors act like this was such a new thing? This is so rampant, but we don't talk about it, and the studies are just starting to happen. And for the year of 2008, the year that I had my son, that equaled to be 1.3 million women. 20% of the population in the United States, women, will get this. But I was screened zero times for this. I was screened for preeclampsia, which is hypertension and later forms of pregnancy, and for gestational diabetes. But if you can see the incidence for that is so much lower, and the test so much more expensive. So what's going on? Is it a mental health thing? Is it a mother thing? Is it a gender thing? I don't know, I don't know the answers, and I, I want to know the answers. I want to know why we can't screen women for this, or even if screening helps for this. I, I want to ask the question, and I want to ask it to the right people. Just for a comparison, I wanted to look at the new cases of breast cancer every year and the new cases of prostate cancer every year. And my mother had breast cancer, and thank God they caught it through a mammogram. And she's alive, and she's in recovery and in remission. But I hear about breast cancer, and I hear um, I will be screened when I'm 40. It's just automatic. It's just going to happen. There are 323,000 new cases every year, and I compare that to the 1.3 million who don't get screened at all and after they have their babies, it's a voluntary thing. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out the disconnect, and I, I haven't figured it out. Prostate cancer, and I know that's very fatal, but I wanted to see if it was a gender thing, and I see that 223,000 men got it in the year of 2008. I found a horrible statistic that suicide is the second leading cause of death in postpartum women. The first is homicide. These are horrible statistics. I would love to tell you the exact number of women who take their lives. I would love to tell you what that looks like, but nobody's collecting the data for that. And I have to ask why. No woman should die from something that is so treatable. If a woman got help right away, there are so many ways to help her. This is my son, and um, I haven't found the right words to tell this story. I know that. I don't know how to make people care or think that it wasn't just 1.3 million women sitting in a corner crying because they couldn't make dinner right. I want to find those words, and I think that's what this film is going to do for me, is to help find a way to really express what I can't seem to express in my words. but. I would have missed him, and I would have missed sloppy kisses, and I would have missed bruises, and him wishing on stars, and loving the narwhal whale. <laughs> this is sweet stuff. It's so sweet, and I'm so glad that there were people that could help me through it. So my name is Maureen.
I'm leading out from a pregnancy, mood disorder, and OCD. I'm one in seven women in the United States, and I'm one of 1.3 million women. Thank you.